Our gospel reading for this morning comes from the fourth chapter of Matthew. It takes place in the immediate aftermath of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan by John the baptizer. In this story, the the language that the tempter uses is a form that doesn't really work perfectly in English, and so it's a little difficult to translate. The, if you are the Son of God, is close to since you are, and so you should hear both of those when you hear the temptations. The question is not whether or not Jesus is. The question is what happens because he is. Listen now for what the Spirit may speak to us through these words. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, the devil's perfectly capable of quoting scripture, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of you on a uh, a regular recurring basis must work mightily to resist the temptation to commit murder or to rob a bank? I'm hoping it's not really very many of you. Um, I realize that we do occasionally say things such as, I'd like to strangle him, but that's hyperbole, right? That's not real. If you watch the news or you read the paper, you know that there are people for whom these are real temptations, but they're a tiny, tiny segment of our society. So what is it that really tempts us? What are our real, genuine temptations that we struggle with? Some of them, no doubt, are um, trivial. Temptations to have another piece of cake or watch another episode of House of Cards. But, But I'm really interested in more serious temptations, those things that tend to deflect us from what it is we should be, who it is we're meant to be. What are those things that might lead us, when we are grown old, to look back and wish we had done things differently? I think that a lot of people envision Jesus' temptations in the wilderness along the same lines as me being tempted to commit murder. Surely Jesus dispenses with such temptations as easily as I dispense with the notion that robbing a bank would be a good strategy for dealing with an unexpected expense. But that's not the picture Matthew paints for us in his gospel. Matthew tells us that the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. These Testing, this this temptation is necessary in some way. It serves a real purpose. And so it cannot simply be a foregone conclusion. 
These must be genuine temptations, real temptations, the sort that we encounter that deflect us from the life that we are meant to lead, that encourage us to be other than what we might be. Theologian Douglas John Hall says there are really not three temptations here. There are three variations on a single theme. Echoing the temptation from the Genesis story in the garden, the temptation is one to power. You shall be like God, the serpent says. And who wouldn't want to be like God? No longer have to wait on God to provide. Can make sure we've got all that we need. No need to entrust ourselves to God. And why shouldn't Jesus miraculously provide bread for himself when he's starving? Why not? A display of divine power so overwhelming float down from the temple top that everyone will have to say Jesus is Lord. These temptations are central to who Jesus is and what sort of Messiah he will be. Will he be the Messiah God has called him to be or will he be the one people want him to be, that many of us still wish him to be? Will he employ divine power on behalf of his people? Will he use force when necessary? Or will he stay true to God's will and God's plan, even on a cross? Temptation will reappear there as the crowds taunt him, saying, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And I think if we're honest, if we were scripting the story, many of us would have exactly that happen. We in the church are called to be And we are told that indeed we are the body of Christ. We are called and are the body of Christ. And so it stands to reason that we also will be tempted to be something other than what it is God means for us to be. That primal temptation to power, to be like God, is ever with us in countless variations. Don't trust God's commands. Trust your own judgment. Don't embrace the cross. You can have Easter without Good Friday. Look out for number one. Be assertive. Demand your own rights. Accumulate and strive for political power and clout. You can be a disciple without denying self, without becoming truly vulnerable. Jesus resists all of these temptations, but more often the church has not. On a recent Saturday at a retreat attended by the deacons and members of our session, what in other denominations might be called the lay leaders of this church. We considered our identity as a congregation. We remembered some of our history. And we reflected on the question of when it was we had felt closest to God in the doing of our work and worship and ministry here at Falls Church Presbyterian. It's not as easy a question as it might seem, because as Jesus' temptations point out, the things that impress us and wow us and move us 
may not be the things of God. Perhaps another way to approach this question, this where in your work and ministry and worship have you most profoundly experienced God's presence, perhaps another way to express that is to ask where in our work and worship and ministry have we been truest to our identity as the body of Christ? Where have we trusted and given ourselves over to God's will and God's dream for a new day? In just a few moments, a new class of deacons and elders will take their ordination and installation vows. The first of a number of questions that they will answer asks, do you trust in Jesus Christ your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, And through him, believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord of all, head of the church. But at the very same time, temptation whispers, it's just a ritual. Don't take it too seriously. Do whatever seems reasonable and best to you, whatever people want, and everything will be fine. When Jesus faces his temptation, there is no question about who he is. He is God's beloved son, the one God loves and sends into the world. There is no question as to his identity, the only question is whether he will be true to himself. In the same way, there is no question as to who we are. God loves us and claims us and sends us into the world. There is no question as to our identity. The only question is whether we will be true to who we are and here lies the essence of the Christian life. Embraced in God's love, we are freed from those worries about whether we are good enough or whether we matter or whether we're impressive enough. We are God's beloved children. We are God's beloved children. And as we fall deeper into this realization, those temptations to power and influence and wealth and so on have less and less hold on us. We can live more and more into our true selves, into the way God sees us, beloved children who are the body of Christ in and for the world. Beloved children who can fully trust ourselves to God's will, to God's hopes and dreams for us and for the world. All praise and glory to the one who loves us, who embraces us as beloved children, and who calls us to bear that love into all the world. Thanks be to God.